Well, I'm going to talk about processing streaming data with Kafka, but I will tell a little bit about myself first. So um, my name is Thijs. I work at AppSignal. So my name is pronounced like this. So this is like the tutorial for how to do that. <laughs> um, I'm from Amsterdam, Netherlands, and actually today is the biggest holiday of the year. So, so uh, Amsterdam currently look, looks like this, like all over the city, and, and I'm skipping this party to be here with you today. So, uh, so you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we do a monitoring product for uh, Ruby and Elixir apps. Um, and as, as always with these kinds of uh, 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 products, you, you, you start with the question, how hard, how hard can this be? And you assume that it's not re really going to be hard, and then of course it always actually is. So uh, it turns out that if you do a product like that, you need to process a lot of streaming data. Um, so, so how our product basically works is that we have uh, an agent that people install on the server. It's uh, via RubyGem. And it's running on all these customers' machines, and they're posting uh, data to us regularly uh, with like errors that happened and stuff that was slow. And then we process that and kind of like merge it all together to uh, to uh, to make a UI out of that and do alerting. Um, and that's streaming data. So streaming data is usually defined like this. So uh, uh, it's generated continuously. Um, oops. Uh, uh, on a regular interval, and uh, it comes from multiple data, data sources which, all, which are all posting it uh, synchronously, simultaneously. And um, uh, there's some, some classical problems associated with this. So, so one obvious one is database locking. But if you do a lot of small updates, then the database is going to be locked a big part of the time and, and everything will become really slow. You kind of have to load balance this stuff around and make sure that ideally, you make sure that stuff ends up at the same worker servers uh, so you can do some smarter stuff with it. Um, so let's look at, at a really simple streaming data challenge that we will use for the rest of the talk to, uh, to, uh, as a use case. So we've got uh, a pretty popular website. It, uh, it has visitors from all over the world. It also has uh, servers all over the world which, which are handling traffic for these visitors. Um, and we want to do some processing on the logs, basically. So uh, 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 we, we have a big stream of log lines coming in, which have like the, uh, the, the visitor's IP address and the URL they visited. Uh, you know, the, the standard stuff. And we actually want to turn it into this graph. So uh, uh, that's a, a nice of, uh, this is a graph of like the total amount of visits we had from four different countries. Um, is this actually hard to do? Um, and the answer is, is that on a small scale, uh, it's not. It's, it's actually quite easy. So the simple approach is, is to uh, just update uh, a database like for every single log line. Uh, so that looks a little bit like this. So basically, you just do an update query. There's a, there's a country table. It has a, a country code and a count field. And you just update the thing every single time you, you, get, a, uh, you get a visitor from that, con from, from that certain country. Um, but the issue is, is that a database uh, uh, has to make sure that all data, uh, that in data integrity is kept. So, so it doesn't actually understand that all these streams are kind of continuously. And they, like the, the, the log line actually never has to go, go back in time and update something. But the database has to take into account that, 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 that data that, that already exists could be uh, updated again. So it has to do a lock around, uh, uh, around a row. And if you do this at a really high scale, then uh, the whole uh, database will just lock down and, and there will be no time left to actually do updates. Uh, so we ran into this a number of times uh, during our existence uh, at AppSignal. So one thing you can do next is uh, sharding the data. So, uh, so you basically use put, put all the Dutch visitors in the database one, you put the US ones in, uh, in number two, and you can kind of just scale it out by just grouping the, 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 the data in, uh, on some kind of axis and just put it in different database clusters. Uh, and th but this has some downsides. So what happens is that if you uh, want to query this data and you want to get uh, an overview of everything that's in there, you, you might have to end up uh, querying different database clusters and, and manually merging all this stuff, which can get really slow and complicated. 
And a classical one as well is uh, changing the, ch the sharding. So if we now decide that we actually want what counts uh, per uh, browser that people use all along, then uh, we have to completely change this around and write a big migration script and uh, it's going to be really complicated. Um, and at AppSigma, we actually do a lot more than just, uh, uh, just incrementing a counter. So we, uh, we do have to do a lot of processing on, the, on this data as it comes in. So we not only have a bottleneck in the database itself, but we also have a bottleneck in the processing that comes before the database. So we started, sort of started doing this at some point. So we would have a worker server, uh, and, and a, a customer's traffic would come to one of these servers and, and like be flushed to a, to a database cluster. Um, there's a really big issue with this, which is, of course, that a worker server could die. And then uh, like this customer is going to be really unhappy because they just had a gap, gap in their reporting for maybe 15 minutes. Um, so what you can then do is just put a load balancer in front of it and all the traffic will be randomly distributed to all these worker nodes. Uh, and, and this works as well, but then still the worker doesn't get uh, all the customer's data. So it has to uh, kind of do like really, really smart optimizations. Um, yeah, so the data is fragmented and, and we cannot really do the stuff we want to do. But actually our life would be really awesome if, if this were true. So we get all the data from one customer in the same, in the same worker. Because then you can start doing some pretty smart stuff. So a really simple, smart thing you can do is this. So, so basically, uh, the, 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 the standard way to do it is just incrementing the counter uh, every single time a log line, line arrives in our system. But if we had all the data locally, we could just cache that for a little bit. And uh, we just have this single, uh, a data query that we could run maybe every 10 seconds, and, uh, and that would totally decrease the load on the database. So this is kind of what we want to do. We want to be able to, to batch uh, uh, the, the, the streams and, look, and do some caching and do some local calculations, and then just write it, write it out to, uh, to a standard database. Um, and we actually need this to do like the, the statistical tricks we want to do. So if you want to do proper percentiles or histograms, uh, you're kind of forced to have all your data on one computer at some point, because otherwise you cannot do the calculation. So we're, uh, we're, so we're back here. So we want to like, route all the customers' uh, uh, streams to a, to a single worker, uh, which gets written to the database. And actually, if we can do this batching, then we don't really need the sharding anymore, uh, per se. So we could maybe get away with just having a single database. But of course, we're back where we started at the beginning of the talk, because we, uh, we now still have a single point of failure. This thing can fail, and the customer will be really unhappy. So we need something special. And that will be Kafka for us. So we looked at a lot of different systems, and Kafka has some unique properties that, uh, uh, that allow you to do, uh, uh, do cool stuff with this. So Kafka actually makes it possible to load banner stuff and and do the routing and do the fill over properly. And I'm saying makes it possible, like not makes it easy. It's still like pretty hard, but it's, at least it's possible, which is better than impossible in my, uh, in my book. Um, so I will now explain, uh, try to explain Kafka to you. And there's actually a sort of complicated thing ab about it, and, uh, uh, which is that there's four different concepts that you all kind of need to get in, in also in relation to each other to be able to understand the whole thing. So it's actually a bit of a hard thing to, to, wrap, your, to wrap your head around if you're not used to it. Uh, so bear with me and uh, I'll try to uh, make it clear to you. So these are the four, the four main concepts. You can, oh, the, the beamer is really bad. I, uh, I, uh, but uh, they will show up. So the first thing is a topic. So a topic is kind of like a database table. It's just a, just a grouping of, of stuff. So, you, so a topic will contain a stream, stream of data, uh, which can be anything. It could be a log line or some kind of JSON uh, object or whatever. Uh, this could all be in the topic. And all these uh, messages, uh, uh, which are in the topic, they're, they're in different partitions. So uh, a topic is partitioned in, say, 16, 16 pieces. And, uh, 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 a message will always end up in one of these partitions. Uh, and the interesting thing is that you can choose how to partition data. So if uh, uh, 
a message that has the same key will al al always end up in the same topic. So we could therefore group like all our US visitors together if you want to. We'll look at how this works in a little bit. Uh, broker is, a, is the Kafka word for, uh, for a server, basically. I'm not sure why they picked a different word, but you know they did. So uh, a broker uh, stores all this data and, and makes sure that, uh, that, that, it, that it can be delivered to uh, the final concept, which is a consumer. And consumer is the Kafka word for basically just a client or a database driver. It's just a way, uh, something you can use from your code to, uh, to, get, to read these messages that are on a topic. And Kafka kind of likes to uh, invent its own words for some reason. So a lot of these things already have a name, but they also have a Kafka name, which can be a little confusing. Uh, so these are the four concepts. I will now go into them uh, in more detail. So this is what a, what a topic looks like. It, it, this, this specific topic has three partitions, and it, actually, and it has a stream of, uh, of messages coming in, which all have an offset. So the offset is that number you see there, which starts at zero, and it just automatically increments uh, up. So new data is coming in at the right side of this, and all the data is going out at the left side. And you can, can configure how long you want this data to stay around. So usually you would maybe st this would stay around for a few days, and then after, say, three days, the, the data at the left side would just, just be cleaned up. It would just fall, uh, fall, off the, fall off the retention. So new uh, uh, messages are coming in from the right side. Um, so if we group these messages by uh, country, as we do here, then, then they will actually always end up in, on the same partition. And that's a really important thing, because, like, uh, because, like, because that, that will uh, become apparent when we discuss the consumer. So next up is the broker. So uh, a broker is, is the Kafka server, and the partitions and the messages live on these servers. Uh, and a broker is always the primary for some uh, partitions and secondary for others. And that looks like this. So say we have three brokers. So uh, broker one will get one to three as, as primary. Broker two will get four to six. Uh, three will get seven to nine. And actually, all these brokers will be secondary for, for, uh, for, for another broker's primary partitions. So uh, that means that if, if one of the broker, brokers die, uh, actually, you can redistribute all the data, and, and it will all still be there. So in this case, broker three died. Uh, and uh, broker one and broker two both got some extra partitions. So if, if you still have enough capacity in your system after this failure, then the whole thing will, will still be working. There will be no, like, the, will, nothing will be actually broken. It might be the case that, that you were, like, maybe had a little bit less extra capacity than needed, and then the whole thing might slow down. But if you plan it properly, then, then uh, this, this is still, like, fully working. And the other thing, uh, this also works the other way around. So if you go from three to six servers, because you, you, you've got a new, big new customer and you need more capacity, it will also just automatically spread out these partitions over these brokers without you really having to do any, uh, any work for it. So the fourth and final concept I will now uh, tell you about more in detail is the consumer. So the consumer is this Kafka client. It's basically comparable to a database driver or, or a Redis client. It, uh, uh, it, it, it lets you listen to a, to a topic. Uh, and, the, and one of the great things about Kafka is that you can have multiple consumers which all keep track of their own offset. So in this case, uh, we have two consumers. Like one is responsible for sending out Slack notifications, and the other one is responsible for sending out notifications via email. So they both start at the beginning at off offset zero. But then it actually turns out that uh, Slack is down at the moment, so we cannot reach our API. So in this case, the, the Slack consumer is still installed at uh, offset zero. It's, still, uh, it's, still, it's, just, it's just waiting there because it cannot continue. But the email notifications are actually going out just fine. They, they don't have any issue at all. And then if Slack comes back up, the, uh, the Slack consumer will actually uh, uh, will make some progress and finally, they, uh, they will be at the end of the, of, the, of the queue waiting for more messages to come in. So th this is pretty neat if you, uh, if, if you integrate a lot of external systems because you can uh, make sure that, that uh, like one outage at a, at a certain vendor is, is not going to, going to impact uh, all the other integrations you have. 
So this example only uh, uh, has a single partition. So uh, obviously, you're probably going to have more partitions. So how about that? Um, and Kafka has a thing for that as well, and which is a consumer group. So the consumer can be in a group. So you give it a name, and, uh, and Kafka will understand that like different consumers running on different servers with the same name uh, uh, are, are, uh, are related to each other, and it will uh, assign partitions to them. This actually looks a lot like how the broker works. So, so if you have a topic with nine partitions and three consumers, uh, all three consumers will get one third of the partitions. Um, and if one dies, the same thing happens. That's, so these consumers get assigned uh, uh, the partitions from the broken consumer and everything will just keep working. Um, so a consumer always gets a full partition, and, 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 and since you can control uh, uh, to which partitions your data, data go, uh, this allows you to like, do this routing thing I talked about earlier, where you make sure that all the customer's data uh, ends up on the same server. So then this, this, so we end up in this situation. So we're, we actually have a very similar situation to the one we started out with, where we have like a few worker servers, and one of them, them dies. But actually, in this case, the customer is not going to be unhappy because the Kafka cluster will detect that the consumer is down and it will reassign a partition to a different worker. Uh, uh, this will happen within a matter of, of say, a minute. Uh, and nobody really notices that something failed because, because it's just rerouted to something that is actually still working. Yeah. So now we're, we're getting to the interesting part, like seeing how can you actually use this from Ruby. Is this clear to everybody so far? Any, uh, anything? Uh, awesome. Um, there, there is basically not really a direct relationship. So the, 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 the brokers and the petitions both use this concept, uh, sorry, the brokers and consumers both use this concept of a petition in a very similar way. But actually, to the consumer, it's, it's not really relevant where the data is stored. It, it just knows that the, the Kafka broker will just tell it where to fetch the data from. So, so from the consumer side, that's just totally transparent. Um, yeah, so we're actually going to build this, 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 this analytic system I just showed you, showed you earlier. So we've got the access logs. Uh, right here, so they're still the same logs. They have an IP address, and we can see the URL. And we want to uh, end up with this table. So it's it's a really simple table. We'll, we'll just keep keep track of how many visitors we get from the US. It doesn't even take like time series or s into account. It's just like a total count for all visitors, like the simplest thing uh, you can do. Um, and we use uh, two Kafka topics and three rake tasks to to make this happen. And our end goal is to just update data in a really simple X record model. So the, uh, the model looks like, like this. So this takes in, a, uh, the model has a, a, a country code and a visit count uh, field. And it takes in a, a hash of country counts. So we will loop through the hash and try to fetch uh, uh, the country by code. If it doesn't exist, it will get created. And then we increment the visit count by the, the total count that was, that was in the hash. So this, 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 this is like really standard usage of, uh, of active record, like nothing fancy going on here. Um, and this is like the, the architecture of the whole thing. So we, we have the three rake tasks on the left side, uh, two Kafka topics on the, on the right side, and then there's a model at the bottom. So uh, first, we will import the, the access logs. These will be written out to, uh, to a, a, a topic. Then there's some pre-processing going on. And finally, we're going to aggregate them and, and write it all out to the database. And you might wonder, why do you need the pre-processing uh, step? Because um, you, you could basically also uh, just, just write it out to the database straight away. Um, and the reason for this is that often, uh, 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 the data isn't, isn't, uh, isn't spread out evenly. So if you look at uh, the, the bars in this, uh, in this example, actually most, most of our visitors are from the United States. So if we would immediately route all this traffic to a single partition, like one worker server will, will have uh, six times as much work to do as, as another one. 
and if you need to do some CPU intensive stuff, that one worker server might have like a huge load while the other ones are, are, are almost doing nothing. And uh, that ends up being uh, really costly. And sometimes you cannot even fix it. You really have to uh, do something else. And this is why we're uh, doing uh, some part of the work before we actually, uh, before we actually group the data. Uh, I'll get to that in a bit. So step one is, uh, is importing these logs. And this is kind of uh, cheating a little bit because in reality, you would, this, this, this isn't really streaming data because we, uh, I, I put a, downloaded a bunch of log files from somewhere and put them on, on my laptop. Uh, what this code does is it, it loops through uh, uh, all these log files and just uh, writes them out as messages to Kafka one by one. But in reality, this, all this stuff will be streaming in uh, from, uh, from all kinds of web servers. So on line six, you'll see the Kafka dot deliver message call. So this this tells Kafka to uh, write out that uh, that line of uh, that log line to the topic raw page views. Uh, at some point, it's done, and then it's uh, it actually imported all data. Uh, step two is then uh, doing the pre-processing. So so we we now only still have a raw log line. So there's an IP address in there and a URL. Uh, we still need to uh, to find out wh what which country it was actually from. So this uh, uh, this is so this is the second step. So we've got a, a, a regex here that can parse the log line. I also found this somewhere online. So this uh, this splits out out the log line into a, into a few different segments. Uh, then we set up a GUIP instance. So GUIP, GUIP is. Uh, uh, is a way to get, get, get somebody's location based on their IP address. And then we set up a consumer, and we ask it to, uh, to read data from the raw, raw page views topic. So this is the topic that we were just writing uh, data to earlier, and we're actually getting it in this, uh, this second break task. Uh, and then for every message, we parse that log line with the GRP and RecX thing, and then we just turn it into a nicely formatted hash. So there's the time in there, the IP address, country, browser, and URL. So, so we actually have uh, uh, like proper, properly formatted data we can do something with in the final step. Um, then uh, we, we write this out to the second topic. So the second topic will contain these JSON objects that are, uh, that, that are nicely formatted. But on line 51, the, the, the actual magic thing is happening because we're setting a partition key. So this will, will, this will tell, tell Kafka, uh, uh, this will help Kafka understand which data goes together. So, so uh, everything that has the same city.country code too will end up in that same partition. So we know for sure that we can aggregate it properly later on. Now we get to the final step. So this, uh, uh, again, we have a consumer. So we're now actually consuming the page view. So these contain the JSON hashes. Uh, and we set up some storage. Uh, this is from line 60 to 62. So on line 61, uh, there's a country counts hash, and it's just a, it's, it's a normal Ruby hash uh, that uses the hash.new0 syntax, which means that if, if uh, no value is present in, that ha in the hash for a certain key, it will actually end up being the value zero instead of nil. So we always, always start, start with a count of zero. Then it loops through all these messages, uh, it JSON parses it again because in, in Kafka it will be, ser will be serialized, so we actually have to like, turn it back into a Ruby object. Uh, then we increment the count, uh, and then we increment uh, uh, the, the, that country counts buffer we just introduced. So, so uh, 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 we're getting the country, we're, look, we're, do, we're using that to do the hash lookup, and then we increment that by one. So anytime we, we have a visitor from, uh, from a certain country, like this hash will get a will be incremented. And then we do this thing every five seconds. So, uh, so this is part of the main loop. So, so every five seconds, uh, uh, this, this thing is invoked. Um, and we call the active record uh, model we, we introduced earlier. So this, this will actually write out, write out the whole current state of the country counts uh, hash to the database. And then it will clear it on line 83. So after this is done, we will end up with an empty buffer again, and we can, and basically the whole process just repeats. 
So what happens it, is, is that, that uh, this, this aggregation task is, is just is reading in data for five seconds. It's, incre it's incrementing the counts in that hash. And then after five seconds, it just writes current state to the database, and, uh, and it will be in there. And then it just restarts and does the whole thing all over again. Um, and, and again, if we go back to the real side, uh, it's all very standard. So, so this is our uh, uh, UI for this. Um, if you look at the controller, we're just fetching the, the country, stat, uh, uh, country stats that are available with the descending count. Then we also have to get the max, the sum and the max of the counts. So we, we know like how wide the, uh, the column should be. And in the view, it's just a really simple HTML table which, uh, uh, which we loop through. And that's it, basically. So that's kind of the interesting thing in my mind is that you can use these, uh, these Kafka principles to kind of like buffer huge amounts of incoming data. And at the end, there's just a Rails app at the end of it, which does no fancy stuff at all. Um, so let's actually look at the demo. So I've got three tabs open here. So this is like the importer. So, so this, this kind of fakes, uh, uh, as you might remember, uh, being, uh, being stream, streaming data. It just keeps like pushing raw log lines into, uh, into a Kafka topic. Um, so then we boot up a preprocessor. So if you, if we pass it for a little bit, I'll just, you'll see that actually this is, uh, uh, we're now getting some proper JSON. So this, this one is from Ivory Coast, uh, Firefox browser. So this, we can easily work with this JSON data. Um, and we could also add a second one. So if we add a second preprocessor, it will get half of the partitions and, uh, uh, and, it, and it will just, just double the capacity of the whole system. Well, if it was actually running on a, on a different server, of course, because my laptop only uh, has so much capacity. Um, and then finally, we run the aggregator. So this is going to output in the... Um, So if you look at Safari here, this is going to, uh, uh, if we refresh this a couple of times, it's going to have the same, same result. But every five seconds, the result will actually increase because we, we're not actually writing out every single update. We're just only writing out these buffered updates. So if you look at the aggregator here, it's currently, it's, uh, it's running for, uh, for, for other countries that, the countries that are in our data set. But again, we can, uh, um, we can start a second one. And you'll notice that uh, actually the, lo the uh, list of, of countries in the, in the first one will actually decrease. So on the next tip, tick of the aggregator in the right, uh, top right tab, there will actually be less countries than in the, in the one uh, uh, slightly up. So this, this list is still everything. And then here uh, on the second tick, uh, which goes from here to here, uh, uh, the second aggregator was started and Kafka noticed that the partitions uh, had to be reassigned and then it actually spread them out over two worker servers. Uh, and, and we just doubled our capacity. And that's what you can do with Kafka. And uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the question is, like, what happens if a consumer dies but it hasn't committed to offset? And I actually didn't discuss committing the offset in the presentation, just keep things a bit simpler. Um, but but it comes down to that, that, it, that the con consumer can control when it will actually tell Kafka that it's done with some data. So uh, when a consumer dies, it can actually rewind a little bit and, and ingest data again. 
So usually that just works out really well because you only commit once you flush to the database and, uh, uh, and then it will be in sync. Yeah, so the question is, is there any restriction to the, to the, to the format of the messages? And uh, well, the answer is no. So a message has a key and a value and both are, are a byte array and you can put anything in there that you like. So we, we use a lot of protobuf uh, in our Kafka topics. So, but you can also use JSON or whatever format you like. Yeah, so the question is like, do you do your own, own operations and uh, uh, how hard is that? And, and that's kind of the disadvantage of using Kafka. It's, it's, it's like you have to dive into a lot of Java things and you need to run Zookeeper and that's quite some overhead associated with it. You can, you can buy it in Roku now and also AWS has something called Kinesis which is, uh, I think, was basically a Kafka ripoff. It's, it's the same thing, only a different name. Um, so that's, that's one ways to just buy it from, from service providers. And if you want to run it yourself, you know, you, you will be in a bit of pain to get it set up. Once it's running, it's extremely robust, but like to understand all the configuration and how to monitor it is, is, uh, is pretty painful. Well, thank you. Thank you.